Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class, where today I want to tell you the story and possible future of a mathematical mystery that was somewhat solved 30 years ago. 30 years ago, the history of mathematics changed when the proof of what's called Fermat's Last Theorem was finally presented, a mathematical mystery that had been open for hundreds of years. And today, I want to tell you about that interesting mathematical historical mystery, as well as what questions still remain. Fermat's Last Theorem regards this equation, a to the power of n plus b to the n equals c to the n. And when this might be possible, with a, b, c, and this n all being whole numbers. Now, if n is 1, of course, there's an infinite amount of ways to take a first power plus another first power added into another first power. And if n is 2, that describes the Pythagorean triples, sets of numbers where two perfect squares add into a third. And last episode, we covered ways in which Pythagorean triples and their friends like Pythagorean quadruples, where more second powers are combined, show up all over geometry. But today, we're going to wonder about powers higher than one or two. Like you can add two square numbers to equal a third other square number, but can you add two cubes to equal another cube? Or what about two fourth powers into another fourth power, or two fifth powers into another fifth power? Mathematicians looked for solutions to this, where these were all whole numbers, but n was greater than 2 for many years and couldn't find one, but also were unable to prove whether one was possible. And that brings us to the story of a cryptic margin note that the mathematician Fermat once left about that question. In the 1600s, the great mathematician Pierre de Fermat who made many great discoveries in number theory and in probability and all sorts of other mathematical innovations. After Fermat died, his son found that in one of his math books, he had written a note in the margin. This note said that it was impossible to have two cubes add to another cube, two fourth powers add to another fourth power, or any whole number solutions to that a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n when the exponent was larger than 2. And then he wrote, in the closest translation to modern English, I have a truly marvelous demonstration of that proposition, which this margin is too narrow to contain. And that was the end of the note. And... He had died, presumably not long after writing this, and nobody knew what the proof he may have had was. For the next few hundred years, many mathematicians worked on this problem, seeing if they could find some magical proof that Fermat might have found back in the day. And because this is one of the simpler to describe open questions in mathematics, and because Fermat had claimed to have some magical proof for it, some historians believe that Fermat's last theorem is the mathematical question that has had the most number of incorrect proofs submitted to institutions. Thousands of incorrect proofs. Other mathematicians did make great progress on Fermat's last theorem over the years. For example, proving specific cases, like that cubes can't do it, but they were unable to prove the general case for all exponents higher than 2. But math is quite interconnected, and sometimes proving something else that you thought was unrelated might help you prove your original question. In this case, 
there were two other subjects in math that mathematicians had been investigating throughout the 1900s that were seemingly unrelated to each other and seemingly unrelated to Fermat's last theorem. These subjects were a type of equation called elliptic curves and something called modular forms. Not to be confused with modular arithmetic that we do on this channel sometimes, modular forms are much more complicated. Separate from Fermat, last theorem, mathematicians were trying to prove a different conjecture about a way in which elliptic curves and modular forms were deeply connected, and they realized that Fermat's last theorem was connected as well. Mathematicians managed to prove that if there was a counterexample to Fermat's last theorem, an example where some powers higher than two did manage to add up in that way, that it would also imply that there must be a counterexample to that other conjecture, which means that if the other conjecture was proven to be completely true and not have any counterexamples, there couldn't have been a counterexample to Fermat's last theorem either, meaning that if this other conjecture was proven, it would prove Fermat's last theorem along with it. And then a mathematician named Andrew Wiles, who had been obsessed with this question of Fermat's last theorem as a child, thought that maybe he'd be able to put together all the pieces, and he dedicated about six or seven years, secretly dedicating hours a day to try and prove Fermat's last theorem. And in 1993, Andrew Wiles made a presentation showing the mathematical world that he had solved this conjecture about elliptic curves and modular forms, and that along with it, Fermat's last theorem had been proven. And oh boy, did it take a lot of long, complicated steps to prove this thing. The proof is over 100 pages, and it did need a few adjustments of things that Andrew Wiles hadn't fully gotten fine-tuned that other mathematicians and himself fixed over the next year or two. By 1995, a fully fixed and polished version, still more than 100 pages, of this proof was released, and the mathematical world agreed Fermat's last theorem had been solved. The thing is, although it's now been proven that Fermat was correct about his conjecture, it's unknown exactly what type of proof he thought he had. The proof that Andrew Wiles ended up finding was so complicated and built off of hundreds of years of cumulative mathematical knowledge that had built since the time of Fermat. And there was no way Fermat would have had access to those types of tools or bits of knowledge that Andrew Wiles had. And if Fermat somehow had some short, beautiful, majestic proof it's unknown what that was. Although many mathematicians suspect that maybe Fermat was wrong. There are some forms of proof that can be used to prove certain cases for exponents using techniques like one called infinite descent. And some mathematicians believe that Fermat thought that this infinite descent technique could go further than it actually could. Techniques that could be used to prove particular exponents, maybe he thought proved the full general case when they actually couldn't. Or maybe Fermat was just messing with everybody and just wanted to prank the world before he died and get people talking about him for a few hundred years, get one of the biggest problems in math now having his name attached. Or maybe Fermat did have some really cool shortish proof that hasn't been rediscovered yet. Now since Fermat's theorem has been proven, we know that although there's an infinite amount of square numbers where you can add two of them into a third, for example this simplest awesome one, 3 squared plus 4 squared equaling 5 squared, but that you can't do the same with cubes. You can't find a perfect cube that adds with another perfect cube into a third. However, there are some ways to add 
three cubes into another, including this awesome one, so underrated, the older brother of this three squared plus four squared equaling five squared, is that three cubed plus four cubed plus five cubed equals exactly six cubed. And apart from that, there are other examples of three cubes adding into another cube. You might also find examples of things like four fourth powers adding into another fourth power. This may make some people wonder, if we're adding numbers of the same power into another of that power, is it going to take at least the amount of numbers as that power, like at least two square numbers to equal another, at least three cubes added together to equal another, at least four fourth powers added to equal another fourth power, and so on. In fact, the greatest mathematician of all time so far, Euler, conjectured that exact thing, that maybe it takes n nth powers added together at a minimum to equal another of that same nth power. However, even the greatest mathematicians get some conjectures wrong sometimes, and that was proven false in one of the shortest papers of all time. A paper that was just one or two sentences showing a counterexample of just four fifth powers adding up to another fifth power. So it does take at least three third powers to add to another, but there are ways to add only three fourth powers into another and only four fifth powers into another. Although interestingly, the smallest amount of sixth powers that have been discovered that can add into another requires seven of them. So it's still unknown the exact amount of a given power it can take to add to another of that same power. And what one conjecture that remains open and possible is whether there's a limit of adding a certain power requiring at least as many terms as the power, including both sides. Like there are four terms total, counting both sides of the equal sign for fourth powers, five total for fifth powers here, and more than that amount for third powers and some other cases. So it is possible, although not known for sure, whether there is a limit based on both sides of the equation for that sort of equation needing to contain at least as many terms as what power it is. Even apart from Euler's sum of powers conjecture, many other questions have been had throughout history about the ways in which different powers of numbers can or can't add together. There are also many unsolved questions about this general equation of a to the x plus b to the y equaling c to the z, where all of these have to be positive integers, but the exponents don't have to be the same as each other. For example, there's an open conjecture, literally worth $1 million if you prove or disprove it, that says that if these exponent numbers are at least three, then the base numbers have to have a factor in common. And another unsolved question that doesn't restrict these exponents to being at least three says that for this form of equation, where the exponent numbers have their reciprocals add up to less than one, there will be a finite number of solutions. And these are the only solutions known that fit those restrictions. Those are just some of many open questions related to which perfect powers of numbers can or can't add into others. And that's all for today. Thank you for joining me here in combo class to learn about... Carla, let's get these things out. 
Anyway, thanks for joining me for today's episode. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, and thanks to all of you. I'll catch you in the next episode.